For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday evening, July the 8th, 1998. Fourth of July, family uh, camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Dale Copeland of Bengal, Oklahoma is the speaker of the evening. In hell is no darkness, he is at morning light, and he's telling us right now to let him have his way. If you listen closely, you can hear him say, and just let your mind go, and let the love begin to flow. Let the spirit of the body of Christ bring you help, joy, peace, and love. Let it bring you life. Many people today they're trying to work things out. In their own mind, they stir up fear and doubt. But if they'll just depend, depend upon the Lord, they will come to one mind, come to one accord. When just let your mind go, and let the love begin to flow. Let the Spirit of the body of Christ bring you help, joy, peace, and love. Let it bring you life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here's another song Brother Buddy wrote, Blow Wind. I tell you, I'm thankful for the moving of the Holy Ghost. Just a little talk with Jesus makes things all right, don't you? Just a little talk with Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is moving by His Spirit. He's, he's doing that which... Many of the prophets of old long to look into. The angels have desired to look into that which God is doing in our lives. We're privileged people, living in a privileged time, really. A time that God will manifest His glory in a greater way than this earth has ever seen. Amen. Praise the Lord. What a privilege that we have to live for God in this hour and this day. When did blow, men can feel it blowing. They cannot tell from whence it came or where it's going. Those who are born to give becomes the part of that wind that leads to life that will never end. And I'm going. Blowing, men can't tell where you're going. Blowing, it's awful cold not knowing. Blowing, I want to be what you are inside of me. Blowing, and take me where you're going. It was carried by the Spirit to a valley of dry bones. He prophesied, they came together, bones to his bones. He prophesied to the wind, and the breath of life came into all of them. Placed them there, in their own land, they felt it flowing. Flowing. Men can't tell where you're going. Blowing, the talk will call not knowing. Blowing, I want to be what you are inside of me. Blowing, 
take me where you're going. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise our God. I want to say once again that I feel honored. It's a privilege to have opportunity to minister, to share of the hope that is within me, to share why I have a hope. I'll try not to be too long-winded tonight. Some of you have got an early engagement. Praise the Lord. Along about the middle of a camp, uh, sometimes the physical body, the, flesh, the spirit's still willing, but the physical body starts kind of tapering off the other direction, don't they? So, praise the Lord. I know when we finished our camp this year, uh, if we'd had to go one more day, I think I just couldn't have made it <laughs> physically. I... Uh, we had a wonderful camp, and we thank God for all that He done and all that He's doing. I, uh, I tell you something, it may seem uh, painful sometimes for the, the things that we have to do and that we need to do uh, to develop spiritual muscles. But you don't develop spiritual muscles by being inactive spiritually. And... Uh, the pain of developing these spiritual muscles is not near as great as the pain and the sorrow of not having the spiritual strength to hold on to somebody and you allow them to fall to destruction. Uh, it's, it's, there's no pain that I know of than to, than to see somebody that you have not walked close enough to God for uh, yourself that you have, are able to have the answer and the, be the intercessor for them. And uh, uh, almost anybody can come to the front for a little while, you know. But it's he that endureth to the end. I tell people everywhere, this is not a hundred-yard dash, this is a marathon. And, uh, and there's so many that looks good in the, in the quick dash. But you can't judge success by this year or this camp. You can't judge success by four or five years. You judge success by life. And uh, God, God looks at the total, complete picture. He knows he who is in tomorrow, already in tomorrow, he inhabits eternity. He is. And he knows what the outcome will be, and he writes final chapters, don't he? And I'm glad that he does. I'm thankful that that uh, what looks to be failure at one moment, when you can look back a few years later, you can see that it was the leading hand of God, just guiding and directing uh, in a path that would bring Him honor and glory. And uh, there's many times that I've shed tears, sorrowful tears, and I've stood in such blackness and darkness through... Uh, financial woes and, and, and spiritual pressures of, of pastoring and, and yet the desire to, to provide for my family better. And I know what it is for your underwear to wear out and not be able to buy anymore, you know. And I walk the floor and say, God, I can beat this. My family don't have to live like this. I know what it is to not be able to buy your children a pot for a month because there is no money. But what it is to burn your bridges behind you and not having enough money to get out of town, the town's only a block long. <laughs> and I know what it is for people after you've done that that beg you to come to change their mind and start railing on you and trying to drive you out and you, you have nowhere to go. I know what it is to stand in darkness and blackness and, and shed tears. And God spoke something to me many years ago. He said, never doubt in darkness what I showed you in the light. Amen. And it was, a, it was a lifeline that God throwed me because in the light He spoke to me and told me to go and to do. And yet, when the, it was the darkest and I knew not what to do and, and I shed many tears. I've told my wife many times, I said, I will hold still because this too will pass. Yes, amen. And the light of day will shine again. 
And I will not move. I will get myself in a place to hear God and to minister to God and allow God to minister to me because He is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. So sometimes when things get to looking pretty cloudy and stormy, just hold still. Find that secret place because there is a God who cares, that knows everything that's going on at the time that it's going on, and He watches over you. Praise the Lord. We, uh, during our time of camp this year, there was tornadoes uh, around the area, and one came over, and and here we were staying in a little, uh, what do they call them, pop-up trailer. And the wind was a-blowing, and it was a-rocking, and the lightning was a-flashing. And, and I told my wife, I said, Honey, let's go to sleep. I said, The God that we serve... There's not a drop of rain that falls on this trailer that he don't know. He knows how many hairs we got on our head. He knows where we are. He knows what we're doing. And he'll take care of us. A while back, uh, tornadoes came through there by the house. And if you was watching the news, it, pro- it was coming, I think, probably, well, it's going toward Fort Smith. But it, they kept saying, you in the Bengal area, take cover now. Take cover now. My son Joshua said, Daddy, we don't have any safe place to go. I said, Son, we're in the palm of his hand. We're in a safe place because we're in the shelter of his arms. We're in his care. And we prayed that God would turn the tornado, and my wife saw it turn and saw it move. Went right around our house. Second time it's done that, it come through one one year, uh, a couple, three years ago when it blew a lot of Tallahanna away. And uh, I saw it coming down the valley of the campground and headed toward the house. And I stayed out there on the porch. I was on my knees and I said, God, take it over us. Pick it up. I'll tell you what, the Lord picked it up as it started coming toward our house. It dropped one limb about 12, 15 foot long out there in the driveway, went right over the house and went back down again. God, I'll tell you something, you can't outdo God. And there's a place to walk where we are in His protection. But I hate to have to play catch-up, folks. You know, you don't want to have to start trying to repent and, and get things right and do all these things when the, tor- when the tornado's coming. That's not the time. Because what you're going to do is you're going to try to be, you're, you're going to approach God in fear. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The wages of sin is not salvation. So, but there is a place. And I've, I've, all my life, all my children's life, I've taught them, don't have to play catch up. Stay current with God. Keep a current relationship with God at all times. At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, the Scripture says. Praise the Lord. We, uh, I want to just give a, a quick testimony of uh, last year during our camp. Uh, there was, I don't know, 100, 150 uh, people down there seeking the Lord uh, in, in front of the, the platform. And, and uh, there was a little blonde-headed girl. I knew some of her history and I knew what was going on. Her mom and dad was in the midst of a divorce. And she came up front and she fell over a bench there and she was sobbing. She probably wasn't 10 year old. And she was sobbing and sobbing. And I knew the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, her prayer will not go unanswered. And I stopped the whole thing. I stopped everybody. I got their attention. And I said, God said this girl's prayer will not go unanswered. She's praying for that her family be not torn apart. Well, I'll tell you something. One day before the divorce was final, God put that family back together, saved that daddy, filled him with the Holy Ghost. They was at camp and testified to it. God's in the restoration business. I'm telling you something. The pain of developing spiritual muscles is not near as painful as losing lives. 
because we don't know how to reach them and to touch them. I, I wept for more than one reason when this little girl was praying. It wasn't just one. There was many there whose homes was being torn apart and broken. We had several there this year that, that uh, when they went back home, some of them we was having trouble with, the young men. And uh, I talked to their pastor and I said, uh, I said, you know, the, these, the, every time we turn around, they're, they're giving us trouble here. What's, what's, what's wrong in their home life? And they said, oh, these boys, when they go back home, they're going back home to a divorce. Uh, their mom and dad's in the process right now of getting a divorce. I'm telling you something. Divorce tears up children. It destroys children. It scars them. And what grieved my heart was that there had to be a 10-year-old daughter interceding for mom and dad instead of mom and dad interceding for the children. It's a sad state of affairs when the children is crying out to God, God save mom and dad. If there ever was a need for the hearts of the children to be turned to the fathers and the fathers to the children, it's now. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is a need, there is a cry in our heart. And, and, and it's not enough. It's not enough to just get them together and for them to just make it to a certain age. I, I was sharing just a little bit before service just with a brother. I, 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 said, I said, young people are growing up. There is a myth called adolescence. It's a myth, folks. I'll tell you what, you, you bought the world's lie. And what it is, is from about age 13 to age 19 or, or 18, they're old enough to, to know what they want to do, what friends they have, what music they want to listen to. Where they want to go, they're old enough to know these things, but they're not being made responsible for anything. And when they get to be 18 and they go out into life, they're not prepared for life. They hit it head on like a car hitting a, a concrete block wall, and, and they start out hindered and hurt and harmed right off. First thing they do usually is go in debt, isn't it? Got to have a car. Got to have this. Got to have that. First thing you know, 19, 20 year old, they're married, and now they're really going in debt. Because they've not used some productive years to plan on life. Hello. That's the truth. If we're children of the light, we better start taking responsibility for them, for the heritage that God has given us. Now, you, you know, you do what you want, but... Uh, I made a statement here the other day to somebody. It's hard to send your children down to the Philistines to be trained and expect them to act like Israelites. Well, do I need to say it again? It's the truth. You say, oh, well, I had so many people. Well, I don't know how. That, listen, God give you an ability. When, when, when you have that child or them children, God gives you an ability that is, that is stronger and you have a greater ability to train them in the way they should go than anybody else. Otherwise, why do you have the responsibility? See, God don't give responsibility without ability. He equips us with that which He holds us responsible for. That is so... I mean, man, that's like throwing spokes into uh, a bicycle going... 50 mile an hour to some people's lives. Like, oh my God, I can't do this. I can't do that. Somewhere we're going to have to draw a line and say, okay, we haven't done this, but let's start making plans to do. Let's try to get some different outcome. Now, well, the bottom line is, is I've asked this question all over the country. Who of you would turn your checkbook over to a stranger? Anybody? Most of you wouldn't turn it over to somebody you knew. <laughs> but most of you will turn your children over to a stranger. Where's your treasure? What is your treasure? Man, we bought lies. We have, we, have, we have been buying lies. God has a manual for success where they won't depart. Not we have to work to get them fixed and, and heal the brokenness and all that. Thank God there's places and, and, and that's available. 
But I want to tell you something. I don't want my children broken. And I've been a running as hard after God as I know to keep it from happening. I don't want my children broken. I don't want my children to have to know what it is to be delivered from drugs. Thank God there's deliverance. But we got a, there, my, there's a lot of young people here that's not on them yet. We all ooh and we ooh and all over people that's destroyed their life and God's really saved in a wonderful way. But what about that one that just walks straight for God? That's the greatest testimony. That's the greatest testimony. But it's not as uh, uh, well. It, yeah, it's not as emotional. It's not as uh, entertaining, and you know, it, it don't. It wouldn't draw a crowd as much. But I want to tell you from experience, somebody who missed God and who violated principles of God, the sorrow, and the pain of having missed God, I still weep when I think of what I've done. I've been forgiven, gloriously forgiven, by my Heavenly Father, by my natural Father, by my family. But there is, there, there is such things, there's things that, there's, there's scars that remind you. And, and because of some of these hurts, and things. I tell you, I love my daddy more when I see him. He's 84, 85 year old now, and I hold him tighter when I see him. I remember a rebellious young man that lifted his arm against him every time I hug him. And I experience the joy of forgiveness. It's always fresh. I. I, know, I tell you, I used to walk down the middle. I'd get up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'd walk up and down the road. I was a long way from home. And I'd squall and bawl, and I'd say, Daddy, I want to come home. But I was ruled by spirits of rebellion and pride and things of this nature that I was bound. I don't want your kids to go through it. Listen, I don't want your hearts as parents to be broken like mine were. We need the hearts of the fathers turned to the children. Yes. Some people told me, what a shame. They told me to, after camp, the last night of camp, the parents came and they, they was crying and hugging. said, thank you for your commitment for, to our children. Thank you. said, you love our children more than we do. said, you're more committed to their salvation. They're both Christian people. I said, I'm not committed to your children. I don't love them more than you. I love God. I love God. And I love God's ways. I love His principles. And so I said, why? What, what's the problem? Oh, we got used to a two-family income. And now, you know, we just, just have to, since I've quit working and he, he just has to. I said, you want too much. I said, you're going to turn around them kids are going to be grown. Already, they, they, they sat down and shared with me. They said, they're having problems with the young ones. said, the spirit of lust and things of this nature. Is, you know, his, his hormones is kicking in. said, we just don't know what to do with him. I said, my God. I told the father, I said, get home. I told the mother, I said, quit desiring so many things. Don't, you know, burn your credit cards. Turn your heart to your children. We have access to such great treasure in God for our children, for our families, for our lives. I, I, I'm a fanatic about it, I guess, because I believe God's a family God. I think He's a family God. Uh, there's sons and daughters in Zion. And uh, He said... Paul says here, said, Hereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy. And you know what? God wants a larger family than He's got. Right. I, I'm just, going, just making a few statements. I'll get my message here in a minute. We have willingly, because we had a heart that was not towards children. And I could go to many of scriptures and show you the heritage of the Lord is our children. But because of a lack of heart for children, 
people have willingly made themselves sterile. Women have made themselves barren, willingly, what in the Old Testament was a curse. They literally have willingly cursed themselves. Hello? Because no heart. You talk about repenting. Yeah, we need to repent. That's why we've got two more little ones now. When God dealt with our hearts about it, I told the whole, I, I surprised the whole camp. I said, God willing, next year we're going to have a child. God has changed my heart. I don't know how many more we'll have. That's up to the Lord. But I want to tell you something. If you want to do spiritual warfare, you know one way to do, one of the best ways to do spiritual warfare is to raise a godly generation that's mighty in spirit. Amen. Raise up an army that is mighty in spirit. Now, that's not the only way, but that's certainly one way. The wicked's not going to inhabit the land. We're going to outnumber them. Hey, they're, they're going to become extinct. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I, uh, where's your heart? Is your heart toward temporal things? Toward comfort and ease and things? The time is coming upon us. I, I believe soon that, that the, all these things that people think is so much treasure, they'll cast them aside and desire with all their heart the things of God. And to some, the door maybe has been shut. i tell you something. I want to lay up some treasure, don't you? I want to lay up some treasure. Praise the Lord. Some of the greatest treasure I have is my children. I thank God for my children. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 6. It's up to us as the body of Christ if we're going to rule and reign with Christ. If we're going to be in charge, if we're going to, quote, take over, we're not going to do that except God through us, the anointing of God through us, who will enable us and give us the wisdom of know-how at this present time. I've heard Brother Jack say I wouldn't want him to even turn over the, the lighting system, you know, so let me get home before they turn it over to us because we'd have traffic jams everywhere. <laughs> If they turned it over to the people of God, they'd get to arguing because they didn't believe like one another and say, you can't push the switch here. You can't do this or that. But uh, through the anointing of God, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to make preparation and plans. If we're going to be here, then we ought to act like it. And I say that with our young people and things. We ought to act like it. We ought to start training our children to be responsible, training our children. I mean, you know what the, the thing is nowadays? Is it fun? Is it fun? You know, fun lasts for the moment and it's over. It can't be recaptured. It can't, it, it can't do anything profitable to the kingdom of God. It's just fun. Now, I'm not a killjoy here. I'll tell you what's fun is to watch the blessing of God work in our life to have a plan and a purpose that we can bring damage to the kingdom of darkness, that we can bring prosperity to the kingdom of God, and watch it work. That's fun. It's fun to set out on a course uh, of life that is successful. It ain't fun when a child... Listen, 80%... So they said on the 700 Club the other day, 80% of the divorces have to do with finance. 80% of all of the divorces have to do with finance. You think they ain't a need for something to happen? People desiring things that they can't afford. It's always necessary, it's always wise to live beneath your means. Not above them, but beneath them. And uh, I... I think that it's important. I don't know anywhere. There may be some places, but I don't know anywhere we can go. I've got a son that's 19 year old. I've got a daughter that's 23 year old. We've got a young, another young man in our church that's 21, and a young lady that's uh, 18, I believe, 17 or 18. It's others, but uh, but these in particular, I don't know where we can send them. 
that they can be taught and trained. I don't know where we could send them. I would rather have sent them when they was 14 and 15. I don't know where we can send them where they can be trained so that when they come into uh, maturity and, and lifestyle of being responsible for themselves so that they are equipped and they can hit the ground running fully equipped, understanding the principles of God that makes things work profitably and morally. Do you know? Anywhere? And we're going to rule and reign? And we have no plan of action, even for our own. And what do you get when you don't plan for something? You get nothing. If you plan for nothing, you get nothing. If you plan for something, you get something. Uh, hey, it's, it's, it's a time of sobriety to the people of God. It's a time to bring ourselves to some reality and, and draw a line and say, Look, we have, we have cared for ourselves. We have heaped to ourselves the blessings and the presence of God, and we've spent it on ourselves. And we've been interested in how we feel in the presence of God, and we've ignored all the... Let me tell you something. The presence of God does not excuse us from our responsibilities. My first responsibility to God is to take care of my wife and children. Husbands, your first responsibility to God is to love your wife as your own flesh. Wives, your first responsibility is to your husband. Well, I'll just obey God. Then you'll obey Him, won't you? You'll obey your husband. Because God said do that. Oh, well, we don't like these. We're too modernized. Yeah, we're modernized and, and we've got shipwreck. We're modernized and we've got shipwreck. Lives going into destruction. God's got a way that, that when, it, when, when it's operated, there's joy. There's peace. We come to Bengal, Oklahoma, 13 years ago. They told us, they said, we're going to have to teach you all how to fight, my wife and I. I said, no, we know how. We just chose not to do it. We know how, but we've chose not to. We've chose to live at peace. When times of trouble has come, we get on our knees I've told my wife, and, and, and she and I is in agreement. There is nothing as important to her and I other than the spirit, our spiritual walk with God. We practice this. You see, what happens is somebody says, uh, the wife says, Honey, can you come here a minute? Uh, well, just a minute. I want to finish. Husband says, Honey, can you come here a minute? Well, I'm busy. Can't you see? I'm... You know what you're saying? This is more important and has priority over you. I told her, I said, when we got married, I said, Honey, I don't care if you're cooking eggs, turn the fire on. If I, if I ask you to come, if they get hard, I ask you to come. It's all right. Amen. I said, there ain't nothing as important as you're in my relationship with each other. Because out of that relationship will come a right standing and a right relationship with God. Do you realize if husbands and wives not together, your prayers are hindered? I'm talking about something that works. Something that works, that you'll raise children that love God. And, and when they're 16 year old, they ain't wanting to go bloom, bloom down the street and run around and, and do these things. They love God. They'd rather be at home when it gets dark than over in town. Because there's peace in the home. Well, mighty army, it's not how much you can say in Jesus' name. Uh-uh. It's, it's, it's how much of Jesus is working in your life. That's what makes you a mighty army. It's not all the head knowledge that you can get together. Man, I'll tell you, I've tried formulas so many times, and I've tried formulas in desperation in moments of tragedy, then they didn't work. They called me down. I was in Illinois and 3 o'clock in the morning hollered up the stairs, Brother Dale, Brother Dale, please come quick right now. Lady's husband was dying. She's crying. She said, What do I do? Well, I just woke up out of sleep. What a, you know, stumbled down the stairs. And, you know, I, I 
glad I slept with, you know, some cutoffs on. I just laid on top of the covers and stumbled down there and we started praying. You know, I used every formula for praying I knew how to pray. I, I, I quoted every scripture I knew quote. The man was still dying. She's sitting over there her, on her knees at the table, got the phone book. She's waiting on me, so do I call the ambulance? I thought, God, how, you know, why am I in this position with a teller to do this or that? Sometimes you find yourself, listen, the tragedy, don't pick and choose. It's no respect to a person in that sense. Uh, you, you can't pick and choose your battles, can you? They show up on your doorstep. They show up in the middle of the night. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law, my wife's brother, their tragedy, their son got out. was a 17-year-old, I believe it was. Got out and got to drink and got called in the middle of the night. He's had a wreck, had a head injury. He still don't walk today by, by himself. He's 26-year-old. You don't pick and choose when you have a battle to fight. I prayed and I prayed and, and I cursed the spirit of death that I did this and I did that. And, and it's like it just blatant in my face. Like I said, I used every scripture. I, I, I recalled every formula I could think of and it didn't work. God spoke to my heart. I turned around I, to get away from what I, cause my, what I could see was eating me up. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes what you're seeing is more real than what God says. And I turned my back on it and I said, God, what do I do? I've done all I know to do. And this precious brother's dying. And the Lord said, well, did you believe when you prayed? Well, yeah, but Lord. I said, I did, but it ain't working. You know, well... The Lord said, well, if you believed me, then you'd start acting like you believed it. Like I said, I'd like to choose my own battles. I wouldn't have them quite that dramatic. You know, I'd start out with a little headache or something. <laughs> wouldn't you? I mean, just give me something small. Let me work up to it. No, you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. The Lord said... Well, you ought to be happy about it if you believe that I'm healing him. My back's turned to him. He's in the death throes, kicking and jerking, and, and she's squalling and bawling. And I turned my back to him, and I start to dance. First few steps were so heavy. And I tell you, the faith of God, the Word of God that is life, the reality that God is life, and He's stronger than death, he destroyed him that had power over death. The real, the truthfulness of it. When I got my eyes off of that, the truthfulness of it come and I begin to dance with all my might. Probably like I mean I was, I was, boy I was getting with it now. I mean, but the joy of the Lord was working. I was, all of a sudden I was happy because I I understood what God said. I mean, but the joy of the Lord was working. I was, all of a sudden I was happy because I I understood what God said. If you believed it, then act like it. You know, when my son comes to me and says, Daddy, can I have money for a pop? If I say yeah or yes, well he says, Good. You know why? Because he knows his daddy if he says yes, it's yes. He believes it. But wouldn't it be awful if I said yes? And he said, Oh, Daddy, I wish you'd give me money for a pop. But, son, I said yes. Oh, Daddy. Just because he hadn't got it in his hand yet. You understand what I'm... Hello, that's where we've all been, isn't it? But when I began to dance before the Lord, that brother quit, quit his kicking and he wasn't dead. That ain't why I quit kicking. <laughs> the joy of the Lord filled that house. He set up, and I went over there, and I put my hand on him, and he was, he was hot to the touch. Hot! 
And I said, you lying devil, you got to go too. And immediately, instantly, that left too. Listen, we cannot believe what we see. We have to believe what God says. This ain't nothing what I thought I was going to preach on tonight. Nothing. <laughs> this ain't nothing what I thought I was going to preach. It's for you, huh? <laughs> Praise the Lord. The look of joy upon this woman's face. Her husband is alive. Not only alive, he's well, he's healed. Oh, I'm so glad that I had been developing some spiritual muscles. You know what I'm saying? It just as easily, had we not been developing some spiritual muscles, had we not been developing an ear to hear so we could hear what the Spirit is speaking to our hearts, it could have been, I could have had a, a much more sorrowful story to tell. The pain of losing one because you don't have the strength to hold on is a lot greater than the pain that it takes, the time that it takes spending time with God and studying the Word of God, sitting in services, listening to the teaching of the Word of God. It's laborsome and it's tiresome, but it ain't near as sorrowful or hard as watching a loved one go that you just can't seem to touch God for. When the strong man's beating on your door, it ain't time to run and get the barbells. Is it? It's time to lay the barbells down, put them in the corner, and walk to the door and say, Yes. I heard somebody say one time, When the enemy comes knocking on the door, send faith to answer it. But you won't do that if you've not spent the time, had the time, took the time with God. Praise the Lord. Most of you know, I, I said no, most of you don't know. Some of you know, I cut these two fingers off. I love to play the guitar. I played the guitar all my life since I was six years old. And for several years, I practiced four hours a day on the guitar, and I got to be pretty salty on it. And uh, we was making trim for our church. And see, it's important not only to have an ear, but you've got to obey <laughs> After you hear. The Lord dealt with my heart three times to have spared my fingers getting cut off, and I didn't hear any of them. I was working with another brother, and I said, You know, brother, I just don't think we need to do this this way. I just, it's not necessary. Oh, but it'll be so much prettier. Well, okay. And uh, when we got ready, we, we started doing it. We did some, then I went to his shop, and he put a dado blade on so we could make a certain kind of fancy-looking trim. And, and uh, I said, Brother, that's dangerous. I don't think we need to be pushing this through here like this. Oh, we're not, we're not doing this for a living. We just got a few more pieces. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I felt checked again. We only had about two pieces left. I said, brother, I tell you, this is dangerous. I said, we need to put a clamp and a board there and so to protect my fingers. We just got two pieces left. Okay. I was using a board about that long to push it through the saw blade. I was being as safe as I know to be. The last piece, we was finished. When the last piece pushed through, that, that old blade caught that board that I had, and it cut these two fingers off. It cut them almost an inch off of the middle finger and a good half inch off of the, the third finger here. I didn't know how bad it was cut. I just knew it went through it. I grabbed my hand, and I told him, I said, Brother, I've cut my fingers off. Let's pray. Well, he shut the saw off, and he was in a daze. He, was, he didn't know what to do. I said, Let's pray. And I started praying. I walked home across the shop, and I was praying and crying. I said, God, I love to play the guitar. God, you give me this gift. Lord, I know by your stripes you're healed, and I know that you're the chief cornerstone. I said, others have disallowed you, but God, I ain't disallowing you. 
You know, when I took my hand off my fingers, I expected to see them. Blood was running down through them, my hand, and I expected to see them back together, everything on. But it wasn't that way. It ripped the meat, the bone was shining, just ripped it, tore it up, and, and uh, cut the bones off, both fingers. He'd walk around and pray a little while, and he'd open the door to the deal and see through the sawdust, trying to find my fingers. But my fingers wasn't there because they was ground up with that dado blade. I'm talking about you don't have opportunity always to choose your battles. And if you're not prepared, what are you going to do? You're going to have to depend on what somebody else has laid up, ain't you? And hope that you know somebody's got something laid up. I told the brother, he said, well, we're going to have to take you to the doctor. And I said, no, we're not. I said, God's going to heal these fingers. He said, man, them fingers are cut off. The bone's cut off. I said, I'm going to have fingernails, and I'm going to play the guitar. We went to the house and bandaged it up. He called his wife from work and said, bring a few bandages. said, Brother Dale cut his fingers a little bit. When she got there, she about fainted. It wasn't a little bit. She thought, it was, you know, I'd cut my fingers off. People began to come as people, uh, my wife found out about it, and uh, different ones from the church began to drive about 25, 30 miles away and began to drive over and from 5, 6 o'clock until... You know what? I was full of the joy of the Lord because I knew there, there was the Lord ministered a verse to me right up front when it happened. Let not him that wavereth think he should receive anything. And I wasn't about to waver because I didn't like the option. Listen, we have a heritage, y'all. It's ours. This is not this is not baloney. This is reality. I've got two fingers back and the fingernails, and I play the guitar, and they grow back, bone and all. This is reality. But we we had prayer meeting. People come. I get to, they say, oh, my God, Brother Daniel. I say, shut up. Don't want to hear it. I said, this is not a tragedy that will not, that, that will stand. My fingers will grow back. By his stripes I'm healed. I said, God will have quit being God for me to not have fingers because I'm not wavering. I ain't get, I'm sitting in the gate. Remember what happened when uh, Esther's uncle sat in the gate? Made people mad, but he knew why he was sitting there. Amen. People didn't like it, but he knew why he was there. I'll tell you something. When you make a stand for God and you know why you're standing... Then you can get all the criticism you want, and you'll still be there when the sun goes down. Because God said, people, you know, I would convince them. They'd get to rejoicing, we'd get to heaven, I'd be waving them, and then realize, you know, things cut off and I'd kind of get a little bit lightheaded because the body still reacts to what's going on. And pretty soon, this brother who's, whose house we was at, you know, he just never had got that good faith yet. And pretty soon he got it. And you know what? People would come in and he'd say, Brother Copeland, can you take the bandage off of this? I want them to see how bad it is so they'll know God really did something. <laughs> when them grows back. He started believing. Faith comes by hearing, don't it? He heard me quote the Scripture so many times. One couple in our church, they come by. They was on their way to the lake. And, uh, and they come by and... She told the church later, she said, after I left Brother Copeland, she said, I had a splitting headache and I took a, brought a whole bottle of Tylenol. Said, when I left Brother Copeland, we rolled the window down as we drive down the road and just throw the whole bottle out. Well, what, I, what I'm saying is there come a time about 9 o'clock that evening that uh, the spirit had kind of settled. Different ones was in different areas visiting and I found myself all alone in there, sitting in the living room and with just my thoughts. And the enemy trying to, you know, he's persistent trying to find a way in. And I, I called, there was two ministers there, and I said, Brethren, come and speak the Word of God to me. I need to be strengthened. I need to hear the Word of God so that my faith don't waver. 
And you know the tragedy? And I don't say, I'm not calling no names. The tragedy is that they come and they say, uh, Oh, Jesus. Uh, didn't know enough of the Word of God for healing and how to build one's faith for that area. To, and I said, Brethren, tell me. And I started telling them what to tell me. And I said, and I need to hear. And by the time I got done telling them what I needed to hear, I didn't need to hear it. I believed it again. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I had big finger guards on covering it, and I kept them things where the bandage would just slip plumb off. I'd go into a quick trip store or something, and they say, well, it looks like you hurt your fingers. I say, yeah, I cut them plumb off. <laughs> and I said, but you know what? They're going to grow back. God's going to heal them. And I had so many people say, them ain't growing back. <laughs> And I always looked at him and leaned across the counter and I said, I ask God, not man. I ask God. Praise the Lord. God is good to us, folks. We have more available than you ever believed. If I could just... I didn't even get to the message that I wanted to get to. I've just now got to the platform where I could really preach the message that I thought I was going to preach. Oh, my God. My God, we've got more available. This is not, this is not hype. I know there's a lot of people that plays with religion, but I'll tell you what, they're gonna, they can't run with the horsemen. When it comes time to stretch out in the race, they're not, they're gonna, they're gonna fatigue because you can't choose your battles. And if you don't have your house built on the rock, it's hard to dig down and put something under it when the storms come. It's a matter of fact, because the wind's blowing on you, it's raining, you just can't you just can't hardly solidify something in the midst of the storm. You better have it built. And I encourage you young people, build your house on the rock. And that don't just mean on Jesus. Get it in Matthew five, six and seven and see what Jesus said and build it on exactly what he said. Man, get these things working in your life. I, I tell my children, I've always told them, I said, you'll never fit in the world. You'll never fit. You was born to serve the Lord. Amen. You will never fit. I said, you may, you may try to fit, but you will never fit. Thank God they've not ever tried to fit. But I, I tell you, I said, you've been marked by the Spirit of God. And I marked them every night of their life. Hallelujah. I've marked them. I rubbed the anointing on them. I smeared them with the anointing of God. I'm telling you something. It's, I've told my children, I said, Y'all, it's time. They're, they're adults. Two of them are. I said, You better get a hold of God for yourself because it won't be long. You'll be raising families and you're going to have your battles. They're not my battles. They're going to be your battles. And every one of you. Now, you know, you can prepare somebody so long, but then it's time to put them out. You can teach them and teach them and teach them. And you can work them through something, but pretty soon it's time to, to put them out and let them have a relationship with God. Make room for God. Make room for God. Praise the Lord. I trust that you have. I trust that you will. I could go on and on and on. God has performed so many miracles for us in our lives. I was supposed to have been paralyzed 24 years ago for life. You know what I done? When the doctors, there was three bone specialists, said you will never walk again if you don't let us operate. In five years, you'll be paralyzed and you'll never walk. I had four discs busted in my back. The form fell about 30 foot at Oral Roberts University. It hit me in the middle of the back. Knocked me about 20, 30 feet. And, uh, and I was in trouble. Had the... My brother-in-law pushed me so hard to get a lawyer and to sue and stuff. I went and visited with one, and, and I seen they were so greedy. I, just, I said, no, nah, I don't want your services. 
said, I want to be healed. I just want to be healed. He called back a few weeks later and said, I've got you $50,000 with settlement without ever going to court. I said, I don't want it. I want to be healed. I told this bone specialist, I said, God's going to heal me. I'm not going to let you operate on me. God's going to heal me. They laughed and said, impossible. It'll never happen. I said, you'll be paralyzed and it'll be too late. We won't be able to do anything for you then. I said, well, I think I'll just choose God. Went and bought me a cement mixer and started laying natural stone. And it hurt. I crawled on my knees and rolled rock. And I stayed on the job every day. No, I didn't go to the government and start asking for help. Didn't go to anyone. I'm not, what I'm saying, I, I'm, you have to hear me because I don't want this to sound like, uh, I, 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 I had an experience and God, God moved for me. But I'm going to tell you something, I know what it is to be committed. And I wouldn't quit. That's 24 years ago. I wouldn't quit till I made $100 because I was going to provide for my family. Many of the night, my wife come out there and drove out there at 3 o'clock in the morning and I'd be out there working because I wanted to be a good provider for my family. I said, God's going to heal me. I'd crawl around, roll them rocks, then I'd lay out there on the ground a while, hurting I'd be prayed for. My goodness, that's why I'm bald-headed, I think. I was prayed for so much. Every time I went to church, and I went to church when they carried me to church because I couldn't walk. And I had them pray for me. And I'd get a measure of relief. I always said, God's going to heal me. God's going to heal me. God's going to heal me. Twenty years later, well, it wasn't quite twenty years. Seventeen years later, I was, it, it hadn't been quite that long. It's been five years since the Lord's healed my back. But there was times that I would be paralyzed. I couldn't feel my legs, but oh, I could feel the pain, you know. And I couldn't get rid of it. Take 14, 15 aspirins a day. Finally got on pain pills and take, you know, seven, eight pain pills a day. And, and it just wouldn't go away. All them years, I mean, I got where I could work and work hard. <laughs> But then I'd suffer all night. But I was, I, it got so bad, I was pastoring by then. And, and it got so bad that I wouldn't go to bed till 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning until I was totally wore out so I could sleep. Because I hurt. One morning about 3 o'clock in the morning, I, I went in there and I laid down and tears started running down my face. And I said, God, I know this is not what you have in mind for my life. I know this is not what your plan and your will is talking about. This is not what... And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I've been giving you just what you said. I said, but Lord, I've been saying you're going to heal me. And he said, and I am going to. I am going to. I told you this morning, I believe it was, Satan don't care what you believe. As long as you put it all. Because you ain't reaping no benefits from it. And I said, Lord, I got you. I hear you. I woke my wife up. I shook her and I said, Honey, take my hand. God's healing me right now. And God healed me right then. <laughs> Twenty years of dummy. <laughs> You know, I'm slow. <laughs> but thank God I got there. Thank God I got there. I, I, I'm telling you something. What you speak, how you believe it, there's an order. It's just like, you know, it's just like putting a quarter in that pop machine. I, I don't think any of you can go out there and put it in this way. You say, but there's a slot there for it. I got the quarter. It ain't going in that way. You can have all the right ingredients, but unless you do it God's way, it won't work. But when we do it God's way, it never fails. It never fails. I encourage you. And let's love God with all our heart. Here, I'll just give you the crux of the, the point of what I would have preached had I preached tonight. I don't feel like I preached. I feel like I just kind of shared with you. I didn't plan it this way, brother. I'm, 
uh, I trust you've been blessed anyway. Jesus said, John the Baptist, of him, there was none greater that's born of woman. Right? That put John the Baptist in a real elite company. Put him at the top of the list of Elijah, Moses, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, David, Solomon. He said, there's none greater that's born of woman. What a mighty man. And John had a revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. But John didn't have a revelation of the kingdom. And because he didn't see the kingdom coming, he sent his disciples down to Jesus and said, Are you the one, or do we look for another? Because he thought the kingdom of God was going to come in the natural. You know what Jesus sent back while the, the lame's walking, and the poor's getting the gospel preached to them? You know what it was? He identified himself with Isaiah 61. It's anointed me to preach the gospel, to poor, to break the bands, to loose the prisoners, you know. Now, John had a great revelation. He had to preach his revelation outside the, uh, the elite company, even though he was in line to be a priest. But what I want you to see here is he's at the top of the list, and Jesus said, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater. Than John the Baptist. Now, I'm going to give you one or two examples, and I'm going to quit. The Bible said the time will come when people will come and sit down. They'll come to the east, west, north, and south and sit with, down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. I know the rest of that says in the children's kingdom will be cast out. But I want, what I want you to get here is that they'll come and sit down with Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Right? I believe I'm going to have that opportunity. And when I do, I want to sit down with Abraham. And I want to say, Abraham, how did it feel when you, after having given Lot the best of the land, you walk up here on an old barren mountain, and God says, Abraham, look around you. Everything you see is yours. How did it feel, Abraham? After having not been selfish, for God to give you everything you can see and whatever you put your feet at. Oh. And I think he'll say, you know, I want to tell you, but first I want to ask you a question. How did it feel when you became an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ? Hey, all these other guys, the John was greater than them, and the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. I'd like to sit down with Moses. Say, how did it feel when you spoke to that rock and out of a, a barren rock come forth water? I believe he'll say, I want to tell you, but first I want to ask you something. How did it feel when that well of living water began to spring up? The everlasting life. You see, we have oohed and awed over natural things, and we've got in our hands treasures that we're not aware of and we're not thankful for. I like to ask the Hebrew children, how did it feel when you was cast into a fire that was so hot that it killed the men who throwed you in? How did it feel when you were standing there walking around and the ropes that held you was broken loose and the form of the fourth man was there? And I think they would like to say, I want to tell you, but first I want to ask you, how did it feel when the fire of the Holy Ghost began to burn within you, when you was baptized with the Holy Ghost in fire? Inside. Inside. They experienced external things that was mighty. But the least in the kingdom of heaven, John's greater than all of them and all the experienced. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. You've got a treasure, and you have access to a treasure that you're not thankful enough for. God bless you. Praise the Lord. I could preach all night, so I'll just quit. You got something to think about. I don't know if you can go to bed and sleep or not after that. Because that's serious. It's, it, it's awesome. It's awesome. And, that, and that's our heritage. That's my heritage. It's yours. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Are you looking to get out of here or are you expecting to walk into the kingdom and take the, the, the land for the king? That's what's been appointed to us if we believe. Lord, help our unbelief. Help our unbelief. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help there be a hunger in our hearts to know Him as we've never known Him before. To search the Word and hide it in our heart that we can stand and declare just as Jesus did that it is written. For in that authority that it is written, we have the authority to bind Him in in chains and set the captives free. And that's what we're called for. We are called to set the prisoners free and to bring a reality of the kingdom in the earth in this hour and day that we live in. That's my calling and yours. Have we taken it seriously? Do we take it seriously? hope you to be stirred to search the word and to hide it in our hearts. Dale, you don't have to go home, do you? Because you still haven't told us what Jesus taught in relation to the Beatitudes. And that's, I, I want to hear that. All the Beatitudes, the Lord showed Dale that each, each Beatitude, Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, brought it to, uh, help me say what I want to say, Dale. Uh, he brought an example of each Beatitude uh, uh, to, to, in, in the Scriptures. There's an example of each beatitude, and I want to find out what they are. I guess I could search for myself, but the Lord showed him, and I'm interested in knowing. Amen. 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 Well, I tell you what, I'd ask Brother Creason to speak in the morning, but Brother Creason, I'm going to ask Dale to come back in the morning and and do that. I I bless the anointing and the under word that, that that's coming forth, and that we can learn, that we can walk in what we learn. We're called not only to learn, but then to walk in what we learn. The revelation of the Word comes to us, not that we can be somebody or be something, but that we can do what we learn. That we can walk in it. And that, and that the young people, we, we old ones need to know, but the young people can follow through and, and, and carry on. I hope I'm here to carry on, but if I'm not, Lord, I want them to be able to. Now, tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a baptismal service down at the boat ramp. And uh, everybody who wants to be baptized, uh, uh, come and I'm going to appoint uh, uh, Sister Diane over here. Everybody, adult, young person or ever, come and report to her. And then we'll, so we'll know uh, who all we're expecting. And uh, we have had, what did we have? I think we had about 20 one time, 20. But every time, we've had a baptismal, I think, every time but one at every camp meeting. Of course, at the holiday camp meeting, uh, we can't have because uh, the lake is gone. They take the lake away from us in December. Uh, But all the rest of the camp meetings, we've had the lake, and we've had a baptismal service at every camp meeting but one camp meeting. And I don't know why we didn't. So there will be tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. We'll eat. As soon as you eat lunch, get ready and uh, put on a pair of jeans or uh, uh, slacks or or, uh, and uh, come down to the boat ramp, which is down at the end of the bottom of the hill down here. Unless you've been down there, you don't see it till you walk right up on it. And uh, that's where we'll be. Well, let's stand. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Creason to come over here and pray and dismiss us and uh, uh, ask for a good night's rest for us and that everybody will go to bed and get some rest and not keep the others up. I hope you're learning to obey so I don't have to come and, and reprimand you. Huh? Oh, that's right. Remember tomorrow, tomorrow, and remember 5:30 for the uh, 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 victory march, and uh, and tomorrow morning there will be some 
uh, cereal and so forth for the children, and at lunchtime, and the rest of us will fast. Father, we thank you tonight for what our ears has heard and what our spirit has felt. God, we just pray tonight uh, for this people. God, we pray that you would touch them, Lord, by thy spirit. We pray, God, that you would rest these tired bodies that's been here uh, for all this week. Brother Miller and all that's taking care of the campgrounds. God, we pray a special blessing and anointing upon them and a strengthening, Lord, of their bodies. We pray blessings, God, upon your people. We rebuke the devourer. And God, we claim victory uh, for the people of God. Minister, Lord, unto them tonight. Give them a good night's sleep and rest. Make their hearts receptive and give them an overcoming spirit. In the name of the Lord, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.